welcome. Welcome to our Graduate Student Symposium in the History of Art. Now in its, I'm gonna take my mask down. Now in its 26th year. Yay! <laughs> Hosted by the Barnes in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania, Temple University, and Bryn Mawr College. This symposium is one of the premier forums for new research and new ideas in the field. Speakers come from nine top PhD programs in the area. For most of it, uh, its history, the Barnes Foundation was sort of cultishly devoted to one single way of looking at art. Some of you, some of you know this. Um, thankfully, that is no longer true. Over the past 15 years, we have become an institution that actively produces new knowledge about our own collections, bringing in more contemporary methodological approaches to the way that we talk about our holdings, even as we continue to seriously engage with um, Barnesian uh, formalism. Much of this new research has been done in close partnership with scholars from the incredibly lively academic community in this area. So this event is, is very special to us for so many reasons. Um, it represents the dynamism of the field, it represents partnership, it represents community. We're honored to be hosting it. I would like to thank our co-organizing institutions, Penn, Bryn Mawr, Temple. Special thanks to David Kim for his leadership on the organizing committee and for his um, very beautiful introduction last night to the, to the keynote talk. Thank you to Byron Hammond for his uh, brilliant talk last night, uh, which was a feat of international detective work inductive logic and dynamic storytelling. Um, it was quite a thing to behold. Thank you to Aaliyah Palumbo, wherever you are, Aaliyah, um, for, the, for the extraordinary care that she put into organizing every single aspect of this event. Thank you to our excellent AV team and to our associate curator, Cindy Kang, for moderating one of today's sessions. And of course, thank you to all the presenting students for sharing your work with us and to their advisors for being here to support them. And so with that, I would like to invite Aaron Powell up to the uh, podium to introduce our first speaker. Oh, I forgot to say that after each talk, um, we're gonna hold, hold sessions until, um, until the end of the session. Hold questions until the end of the session. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Martha. And thank you to the Barnes, too. This is a wonderful opportunity to be here and hear some exciting new work. Uh, good morning. My name is Erin Powells. I'm an assistant professor of art history at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University. And it is with great pleasure that I am here with you today to introduce Dr. Brittany Emmons Strupp. Um, Dr. Strupp is a recent graduate of the PhD program in art history at Temple University. She also holds an MA in art and architectural history from the University of Virginia and a BA in art and art history from Colgate University, where she graduated with honors magna cum laude. In addition to her academic credentials, Dr. Strupp is an emerging curator of note. She has contributed to major reinstallation and exhibition projects in American art at a number of East Coast museums, including the National Gallery of Art, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and our own Philadelphia Museum of Art. Most recently, Dr. Strupp assisted Crawford Alexander Mann, um, former curator of prints and drawings at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, with an exhibition that is currently on display at SAM in Washington, DC, uh, entitled Sergeant Whistler and Venetian Glass, American Artists and the Magic of Murano. And you should go see it if you haven't had a chance yet. Her talk today is drawn from her dissertation, which she successfully defended at Temple this past November. Um, that project is called Between Impressionism and Realism, The Early Career of Robert Henry. Uh, this dissertation work re-examines the early career of an artist who traditionally has been regarded as the quintessential American realist, 
and her work reveals the transnational influences, historical perspectives, and artistic confabulations that consistently shaped his career output. Her talk today uh, is entitled The Dignity of Life, Robert Henry's Portraits of Chinese Americans. And without for further ado, um, I give you Dr. Straub. Thank you. Very excited to take my mask off. Um, thank you, Erin, so much for that kind introduction. Um, and a special thanks, as everyone will probably say, to the Barnes Foundation and to Alia for all of your answering all of my many questions. Um, and to the department, the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University. Um, I'll just get started. As Erin said, Robert Henry is regarded as the quintessential American realist and the outspoken representative of the Ashcan artists who captured scenes of daily life in New York City at the turn of the 20th century. As a group, the Ashcan artists, with Henry at their helm, believed art should reflect real life and be inclusive of the lower classes rather than only the exclusive upper classes. Inspired by his influential philosophy of artistic practice, Henry's followers learned to embrace their individuality and to represent their engagement with the social and political realities of life, modern life in America through art. For his own part, however, Henry largely avoided the social critique and reform-minded politics embraced by many of his students and followers, which includes John Sloan and George Bellows. Instead, Henry painted individuals from different races and cultures in order to capture the individual's innate character or spirit on canvas. And as a group, he titles these portraits, My People. Working in response to the outbreak of World War I in 1914 and the 1913 Armory Show, Henry updated the My People project nearly a decade after he began painting them in his search for a modern means of expression. Most relevant to our modern moment, this project takes a second look at his problematic portraits of Chinese Americans, which were painted in La Jolla, California between July and September 1914. Conventionally read through lens of quote-unquote realism, broadly defined, this small group of surviving portraits have been closely associated with the work of the Ashcan realists. Not quite honest representations of contemporary individuals, and not painted in direct response to contemporary social issues, however, these images illustrate the fluidity of realist representation at this time. Rather than paint the lived realities, these portraits are tempered by Henry's imagination, popular culture, and the Japonisma of James McNeil Whistler, the Impressionists, and the Symbolists encountered while a student in Paris. In an effort to redefine his work following the Armory Show, where European modernism and abstraction were introduced to a broad American audience, and working in response to the outbreak of World War, Henry incorporated principles of Asian art with contemporary imagery of Asian peoples to create a new aesthetic distinct from earlier efforts. While Chinese in subject, Henry modified his knowledge of Japanese art learned through various 19th century precedents, such as World's Fairs and French Modernism, to update his aesthetic. He adapted existing representations of Chinese Americans in the United States from painting and photography through careful cropping, indistinct spaces, and evocative color to create stereotyped images of Chinese Americans that were as representative of an imagined cultural authenticity as they were portraits of real individuals. While his paintings arguably perpetuate popular stereotypes of people, about peoples of Chinese heritage, Henry's intention was to restore an ideal relationship between cultures, which he felt was threatened by World War in 1914. Writing in The Craftsman in his well-known and oft-quoted essay, My People, Henry explained his project retroactively in 1915. And I quote, the people, of, uh, the people I like to paint are my people. Whoever they may be, wherever they may exist, the people through whom the dignity of life is manifest, that is, who are in some way expressing themselves naturally along the lines nature intended for them. This thing that I call dignity in a human being is inevitably the result of an established order in the universe. Any right understanding of the proper relation of man to man and man to universe would make war impossible. I am looking at the, each individual with the eager hope of finding the dignity of life, the humor, the humanity, the kindness, something of the order that will rescue the race and the nation. That is what I have wanted to talk about and nothing else. In locating the dignity of life in his Chinese subjects, Henry hoped to restore an invented order and pre-war balance in the world. He expressed this through his sitter's physical appearance, 
which he modified to reflect his perception of their mother country's essence rather than their more Americanized qualities. In reasserting their cultural heritage, Henry believed he was reconstructing older forms of racial difference, which he connected to a more peaceful moment in world history. Through his restorative project, Henry positioned himself to recuperate both the American race and the nation at a pivotal moment in American history. His application of an Asian or orientalizing aesthetic to his portraits of Chinese Americans is his attempt to reachieve or achieve that pre-industrialized state by reculturing his sitters and thus reassociating them with their quote unquote native China. In part because of Henry's editorializing and preference for unassimilated individuals in these portraits, and because of his distinct interest in formal issues, Henry's efforts challenged the straightforward realist approach with which his My People portraits are most often associated. This, however, has led to valid interpretations of Henry's portraits as racist and culturally insensitive because he does not acknowledge them as distinct individuals within a modern American society, so much as invented cultural icons. The importance of this project to Henry and its relative modernity were also related to his desire to reinvent himself and make his art relevant, relevant again after the Armory Show. There, the naturalism of his project was compared unfavorably with the highly abstract work of artists such as Marcel Duchamp. Henry painted a new subject, subject in a new style with his portraits of Chinese Americans, exper experimenting freely in an effort to modernize the My People project. These portraits were as much a reflection of his, the artist's, perspective and effectual connection to his subject as they were representations of individuals. But they are complicated by the relationship to real people and real cultural inequalities in the early 20th century. And this has led to much misunderstanding surrounding Henry's portrait subjects from this period. In contrast with Henry's other My People portraits from Spain, Ireland, Holland, and rural Maine, for example, his portraits of Chinese Americans are marked by their more decorative treatment relying on distinct color harmonies, culturally specific costume, and recognizably Asian subjects. Rather than limit the racist undertones of his portraits through aesthetic exercises and tonal arrangements, however, Henry emphasizes the racialized identity of his sitters as a way to highlight cultural difference. By painting aestheticized and romanticized portraits of Chinese Americans, he could celebrate them as a distinct race or culture, something that he believed was ultimately lost through immigration and the process of assimilation, while also benefiting from the period fascination with the exotic quote-unquote other. Despite focusing on a distinct cultural group, Henry's knowledge of Chinese culture was very limited. He did not paint the lived experience of the individuals he encountered in California as he had in previous portrait groups, but rather his perceptions of them as mediated through Western descriptions in popular culture, including photography or dance performance, newspaper clippings, which he pasted in his boyhood scrapbook. And I show you these two I discovered among many in his, um, boy at his boyhood home. Part of Henry's inspiration for his portraits of Chinese Americans may have been closely related to his experience with Asian cultures at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. Numerous images of Chinese and Japanese displays and individuals were published and distributed commercially as ethnographic, repertorial, and souvenir photographs. Although Henry's portraits should be considered in relation to these popular images distributed at the fair and afterwards, indeed he looked to them for distinct cultural signifiers, Henry had a different end goal and his project was decidedly more complicated than a xenophobic representation or ethnographic comparison of different races. Rather than represent nameless women, men, and children without differentiating between them, allowing one individual to stand in for the whole, he painted each figure with discernible features and costume and identified most of them by name. His portrait of Chow Choi, for example, probably represents Mary Chow Choi, whose name was found and confirmed in local census records. Henry also recorded her name Mary in his record book, but his retention of only her child, uh, Chinese family name and not her full name underscores his interest in racial difference and authenticity. Because Henry's paintings drew on ethnographic photography and popular culture, however, they are irreversibly linked to this tradition, and this understandably taints Henry's portraits of Chinese Americans. While his stated purpose was cultural authenticity, all of his subjects were recommended to him by his student, Alice Clauber, who found him models in nearby San Diego and brought them to La Jolla to pose. Clauber had spent a significant period of time in the quote-unquote Orient, and through her travels, she acquired a large collection of Asian art, which she later do donated to the collection at the San Diego Fine Arts Gallery, and Clauber was actually named an honorary curator of Oriental art there in 1940. As a quote-unquote expert in Asian art, she likely influenced Henry's understanding of the subject and the related communities is more Chinese than American.
Most images of Chinese people in Chinatowns in the early 20th century were crafted to maintain an image of them as unchanging in the face of onrushing modernity. Images of quote unquote old Chinatown and unassimilated Chinese immigrants became especially valued after the 1906 earthquake destroyed much of San Francisco's Chinatown. They became what Anthony, historian Anthony Lee has referred to as quote unquote purveyors of otherness, freezing the Chinese experience in time and preserving the fantasies of tourists. This certainly appealed to Henry, who sought unassimilated subjects for his My People project. As Lee's pointed out, however, the destruction of San Francisco was also a chance for Chinatowns in California and across the country and their inhabitants to redefine themselves and modernize their communities. Consequently, Henry not only encountered Chinese American subjects secondhand through a middlewoman, he also met them after 1906 when Chinese American populations were rapidly evolving. But old Chinatown persisted in visual imagery, providing Henry with a lasting model for his representation of the other. Period interest in people of Chinese heritage and Chinatowns fueled the proliferation of imagery. Oops, I'm behind. Sorry. Um, fueled the proliferation of imagery of Chinese Americans as existing in the past. Most of these images were produced by white artists, primarily photographers like the prolific Arnold Genth, and then distributed across the country. Representations of women and children were especially valued because they were a perceived novelty in Chinese quote unquote bachelor societies, a direct result of racist legislation like the 1875 Page Act, which prohibited the immigration of Chinese women to the United States. Henry's paintings exist squarely within this tradition. He's often praised for the honest and even individualized appearance of his sitters, but his treatment of composition, color palette, and costume countered this honesty with racializing undertones about a perceived Chineseness. For example, rather than paint children in the Western attire they likely wore in their day-to-day -day lives, Henry painted them in brightly colored silk jackets and dresses. As young girls in candy-colored outfits and sweetly submissive poses, he perpetuated the image of China girls as innocents or China dolls. This impression was enhanced through their setting. He positioned them in front of nondescript backgrounds of pure color complementary of their skin tone and perceived cultural countenance, rather than painting them in a contemporary Californian setting. The backgrounds for most of his surviving um, for most of his surviving portraits of Chinese Americans are painted in variegated shades of yellow, a highly stereotyped reflection of their skin color, or blue or rose, a complementary shade to the quote unquote yellow of their skin, to create carefully planned color harmonies and expressive uh, carefully planned and expressive color harmonies. Even more so than the adults, Henry was interested in children. He emphasized Victorian ideals of innocence and purity in children, which he equated with racial and cultural authenticity. In truth, however, these children were almost certainly American born in 1914, possessed westernized names in daily life, and probably received schooling through both Chinese public schools and missionary-run private schools. As Clauber's contacts, the models may also have worked for her in some capacity as house staff, a vocation many young Chinese girls assumed in California at this time. As a result, the Chinese types Henry had desired to paint were perhaps not as representative of a race as he had hoped. Henry's disappointment with the level of acculturation these immigrants had experienced by 1914 was palpable in his letters to the East Coast and in his record books. One of his earliest models, Jim Lee, a vegetable merchant, was described by Henry as, quote, a Chinaman, but hardly the type I wanted, too middle class and too American. Very little of the mystery of China, rather only the transition in him, end quote. Henry painted three portraits of Lee despite his perceived shortcomings as a model. And in one, Lee's portrait appears quickly painted and sketch-like in comparison with Henry's other portraits of Chinese Americans, creating a feeling of spontaneity and by extension, authenticity. Henry then amplified the more stereotyped aspects of Lee's appearance in order to make him a more racialized subject. The brilliant color and animated brush strokes also suggest the 19th century French modernisms of Claude Monet, Pierre Auguste Renoir, and Vincent van Gogh encountered by Henry during his extended stays in France and at the Armory Show, marking these as a direct response to that work. In other words, there are important slippages as Henry manipulates the hypermodern visual language introduced at the Armory Show to portray Chinese Americans like Lee as existing in an idealized past. Like Lee's portrait, Henry's Chinese lady ignores evidence of social change, instead painting a monumental portrait of an unnamed woman. Her ample figure, painted larger than life, is exaggerated and takes the form of a seated Buddha, creating a feeling of deep stillness. Additionally, Henry's compositions suggest traditional Chinese ancestor portraits and builds continuity between disparate artistic traditions through her frontal pose, 
the lack of shadow, and the vacant and ambiguously empty space. And Henry may have seen examples of such ancestor portraits in Clauber's personal collection in uh, California. The darkness of her body is offset by the, by the jarring and vibrant ochre of the background, which is disconnected from the sitter and almost appears gilded, adding a level of veneration to this icon-like portrait. The combination of European and Eastern religious iconography is striking and adds, a com an apparent, uh, adds to the apparent exoticism of the painting. Finally, Henry's contrived yellow and yellow color palette of stereotyped skin and bold background both reinforces her racialized identity and functions as an aestheticizing color harmony similar to Whistler's monochromatic or tonally limited portraits. In addition to Jim Lee and the Chinese lady, Henry completed portraits of at least four different female child models. As we've seen before, Mary, or Chow Choi, was the first Chinese-American subject Henry painted in California, and she embodies his goals for painting following the Armory Show. Like the adults, she is posed in traditional-looking clothing and painted in carefully strategized palette designed to complement her childlikeness and stereotypical features, with what Henry scholar Valerie Ann Leeds has described as, quote, porcelain skin, slanted eyes, and dark hair. In the end, Henry's project was never to capture people as they looked, but as he experienced them as representatives of their respected races and cultures, raising questions about power and agency. They exist between past and present as idealized figures not completely real and not completely imagined. This museumization of a people or the concept of freezing a group of people in time and reinterpreting them allowed Henry to de-Americanize these Chinese Americans. In the process, he was able to redefine the possibility of modern art as a restorative to what he considered a corrupt world culture after the Armory Show and after the outbreak of World War I. Thank you so much. have to demask because I just can't talk with these bloody things on. Um, um, hi there. I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, introduce myself. I'm Anthony Colantuono, professor of early modern European art at the University of Maryland in College Park. I want to join with my colleagues here in thanking the organizers of the symposium, which not only showcases the work of our graduate students, but also each year reassures us that the future of our beloved discipline, which we have also carefully cultivated for so many years, is in very good hands. And today it falls to me to introduce my advisee, Tony Kui. And indeed, I feel most privileged to be able to work with such a talented student. In 2019, Tony earned his BA in art history at New York University with high honors and departmental honors, working closely with my esteemed colleague in Italian Baroque art, Professor Louise Rice. He came to the University of Maryland's Department of Art History and Archaeology, already well in command of his field. And in 2021, he earned the MA with a brilliant thesis titled Guido's Compendio, Diseño, Colore, and the Idea of Summary Forms. Tony is currently completing his PhD coursework in the field of uh, Baroque art, mainly Italian, but I don't think exclusively. We'll, we'll work on that. Uh, also serving as the department's GA for under, undergraduate advising and contributing in countless ways to the department community. His presence is such that ever since he came to the department, I have taken to signing my internal emails as that other Tony. In the area of research, what I most admire about Tony's work is the penetrating historical intelligence, critical acumen, and methodological resourcefulness with which he attacks <clears throat> interpretative problems, a veritable onslaught of inquiry that leaves no stone unturned until the work of art yields up its long-held secrets. As you'll see, he's also gifted with what I like to call the nose for news, an ability to find exciting, consequential, and previously unexplored topics amidst the mountainous remains of our vast art historical field. I leave it to Tony Cui to explain the mysterious and intriguing title of his paper today in Omnium Fine de Figitur, Conchatismo and Atomic Matter in Salvatore Rosa's Democritus in Meditation. Thank you, Professor Colin Tuono, and thank you all for being here. You will see that there's a slight change of title here, and um, I will explain later why the change has happened. In March 1651, two friends gathered in front of a painting. One was collector and curator Niccolò Simonelli, and the other was painter Salvatore Rosa. 
Together, they looked at Rosa's Democritus in meditation, which was soon to be exhibited at the Pantheon. Although it was not uncommon for friends to discuss paintings like this, this meeting had some special importance. In a letter to his friend, Giovan Battista Ricciardi, Rosa wrote that, quote, in a week from tomorrow, I'll exhibit my painting of Democritus on the feast day of St. Joseph at the Pantheon. And I swear to you, my friend, that I have worked on this picture continuously for eight more days and can say that I have raised it to a degree of perfection having added some other anatomical fragments to it with an ancient tripod, and I have harmonized everything together wonderfully. But since fame is a whim of fortune, we'll have to wait and see. What's important is that until now, no one else has seen it except for Simonelli. As I have kept it locked up in a room, I'll tell you everything that people say about it in detail." End quote. In today's talk, I want to use the painting as a window into the intellectual space inhabited by people like Simonelli and Rosa, so that the representation of an ancient philosopher and the conversation that it inspired might tell us something new about the artist and his world. We cannot eavesdrop on the private exchange between the curator and the painter, but a few things must have stood out. Engaged with academic institutions and as manager of elite private collections, Simonelli would quickly notice some of Rosa's recurring motifs. He could, to begin with, point out the array of morbid things that suggest the immediacy of death, the uselessness of knowledge, and the brevity of life, the nocturnal owl, a dead raptor with its talons and hefty volumes, the severed head of a boar, crawling yet uprooted vines, scattered books with torn pages and dirty covers, a dead rat next to the artist's signature, and of course, the troubled Democritus clad in black. He could also point to the antique objects, the terminus figure marking the limit of life, an incense burner recalling pagan rites of magic, the ram-headed armrest of a couch out of use, a carved stone relief, a broken obelisk, an, an urn with bones sticking out of its mouth, a decrepit sarcophagus no longer able to hold its skeletal resident, ionic and composite capitals fallen from their heights. Friends with antiquarians and Egyptologists, Simonelli knew the subject well enough to make the right point, that these ancient things contextualize the philosopher's life and remind us that all civilizations, no matter how brilliant, must fall apart. Finally, he could talk about the assortment of dead things on the ground as another form of vanitas, reminders of death and human folly. The skeletons show the inevitable outcome of mortality and recall a distant past, which makes them effectively both morbid and ancient. These categories belong to familiar iconographies that have been studied by art historians and to great effects. Richard Wallace, Wendy Roworth, and Katharina Volpi have related this image to antiquarianism, vanitas, satires, and melancholy, which are threads that inform my reading. Rosa was versed in all these topics, and his mastery of these discourses was probably why he chose Simonelli to preview this painting, which was a secret at the time. As Simonelli traveled among literati circles and managed princely collections, to check the painting's legibility by him, ensured that the artist's sophisticated work could make sense to most of the Roman elites. In today's talk, however, I want to believe that there were things that Rosa needed to explain even to Simonelli, things that did not make immediate sense to even the most educated eyes. This need for complication to suggest there is more than just a compilation of conventional iconographies comes from Rosa's editorial intervention. In turning the painting into print, Rosa added a provocative adage, Democritus omnium dirisor in omnium fine defigitor, which is to say, Democritus, he who laughs at everything, is dumbfounded at the end of all things. Here, Rosa makes two important points that this is an extraordinary representation of Democritus, who usually laughs at everything, and that this shows the moment 
when the philosopher no longer laughs, when he is confused, defigitor, in the face of all things coming to an end. Even for Rosa, who is rarely humble, to claim to visualize fine omnium, the end of everything, is still a rather ambitious conceit. Yet as we have seen, this painting does encapsulate an almost encyclopedic range of matters. From ancient architecture to modern books, live animals to ossified remains, Rosa fills his image with things of divergent nature and from distant periods. These objects relate to the finality of life and the transience of material, where the morbid, the dead, and the ancient all denote the fragility of human endeavors. So from the outset, the democratizing meditation does show the end of everything, and Rose's point about universal finality is consistent with the early modern tradition of vanitas. That said, I believe a more metaphysical process is also taking place here. Since this is not a portrait of just any philosopher, but Democritus, one of the founders of atomism, we must begin by approaching his portrait in atomic terms. According to Democritus, the world is made of small, indivisible particles that are fundamental to any matter and its properties. Take the objects on the ground, for example. In atomist theories, bone atoms are inherently different from flesh atoms. So when something dies and the flesh atoms dissipate into the void, bone atoms, which are heavier and therefore less prone to motion, stay put and constitute what we perceive as white skeletons. By this logic, Rosa's Democritus divides the two states of matter amid transformation. On one side, we have recently dead things whose atoms are yet to scatter, and on the other, we have long dead things whose bone atoms are all that remain. Since atoms are impossible to visualize, and since the atomist mechanism sounds rather esoteric, you might think that this is a far-fetched way to explain the painting. Such are reasonable doubts. But here I believe that Rosa was indeed thinking in atomist terms. After all, the artist himself had written a satire where he describes how, quote, the Colosseums they fall, the terminuses they tumble, the world is made of dust, and its grandeur contains nothing. Human vanity is smoke, a worm, life is a comic pretense that draws and beguiles us, but it is only the cradle for a tragedy. Jeez, right? This passage is a perfect comparison to the painting. It uses the morbid, the ancient, and the dead to show everything's downward progression. But more importantly, and I think this is where a key argument must be made, Rosa's invocation of life's empty contents and deteriorating nature was conveyed in a language of atomic, atomic decomposition. According to Rosa, it is because the world is made of dust and because appearance is nothing that things always fall apart. Life can only temporarily hold matter before atoms return to chaos, just as Democritus is witnessing. In this sense, we can interpret his anatomical forms as evidence of atomic composition and nature's annihilating momentum. A bucranium, a boar's jaw, a screeching baboon were dehydrated fish all illustrate the immutable essence of life and its destiny for cosmic emptiness. As Rosa wrote about the world being made of dust, about the omnipresent nothingness, which are Democritus' notions, he painted matter, whether be it morbid, dead, or ancient, to show perpetual and universal decomposition leading to the end of everything, or as Rosa put it, in omnium fine. Rosa probably needed to explain this metaphysical vision to Simonelli, and in the process, he probably also had a few clever puns to make. For centuries, Italian artists had used bones, antique sculptures, and animals, you see where this is going, to study compositio, the art of composing images by arranging various materials into a coherent program. In Vico's nighttime study session, the dead, the ancient, and the morbid, become the literal matter for artistic design. Rosa's Democritus also bears striking resemblance to Vico's confused, perhaps even hopeless draftsman, who must learn the art of catching everything's essence via graphic forms, a process not unlike the atomic 
rhetoric in which everything is analyzed and distilled in granular terms. At the same time, the chaotic windswept setting also refers to Sadio's design for the satirical stage, where the rustic setting provides a pastoral conceit about human artifice. So apart from its relation to the artist's own poetic output about nothingness and atoms, Rose's painting is also a verbal game that shows off his ability for intelligent composition. While it is full of decomposing things, it is also composed according to the tradition of good diseño, where both object studies and the overall composition convey the essence of diverse matters. According to Rosa's letter, he was still adding objects days before the exhibition, and he was confident that he had elevated the painting to a degree of perfection. The problem then is that this painting does not strike its viewer as embodying perfect harmony. From the outset, it is disorganized, excessive, and without a clear narrative. So to understand the kind of perfection that Rosa had intended and boasted, one must have knowledge about both his source materials and his verbal wits, and then understand them according to the scientific logic and conceptual layers that Rosa has intended. Rosa's Democritus therefore probably sustained hours of discussion in his studio, where I'm sure the clever and often pompous Rosa had a great time unfolding the painting, where even someone like Simonelli probably needed some help unpacking the many strands of infor information and interpretation that Rosa has intended. This is why the element of confusion embodied by the dumbfounded Democritus was necessary for Rosa to highlight as he wrote on the print that Democritus, he who laughs at everything, is now bewildered. This, however, should be another source of confusion. For an early modern viewer, Democritus had always appeared as he who laughs at everything, life's meaninglessness, world's endless puzzles. As we see in emblems where at the world's end, Heraclitus weeps while Dem Democritus laughs. But Rosa made his Democritus fundamentally different from the norm. Instead of the heedless and jocular philosopher that both Bramante and Rubens portray, Rosa's Democritus is sad, halted, confused, whereas Rosa describes him, defigitor. Here the philosopher resembles Durer's Melancholia and Raphael's Heraclitus. The theme of confusion thus unites the painting's art historical quotations, especially as Durer and Raphael's inventions are already about troublesome knowledge, about th thoughts without resolution. According to Rosa, Democritus has now seen the horror of atomic decomposition, learn the bleak truth of everything's fatal destiny, and therefore stopped laughing, so that he who always laughs is now dumbfounded at all things end, in omni infine defigitor. It is not easy to make sense of Democritus' confusion, at least not at first. With Rosa's rich iconographies, labyrinthian metaphors, and intricate rhetoric, it is one thing to make sense of his many motifs on their own, yet quite another to synthesize their connections and understand why such a crowded, messy, or even chaotic array of objects can convey a unified theme, let alone a universal message. This talk tries to show that altogether, Rosa's collection of things not only represents immense materiality, but it also dramatizes the complexity of visual understanding and demands a viewer's holistic grasp of art, science, philosophy, and literature. As confusion translates into meaning, the artist's unique cultural consciousness rewards a viewer's sustained attention and their labor of interpretation, where it is in understanding bewilderment that we arrive at clarity. In this constant shift and turn of meaning, the artist gives substance to his model, in omni infine defigitor, as a painting meant to confuse and then dazzle the scrupulous Roman audience, Rosa's Democritus challenged even someone as highbrow as Simonelli himself, and perhaps it should fascinate someone as modern as us. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Stephen Campbell from Johns Hopkins University. I'm here to introduce uh, Jason Minkiewicz. Um, I've known Jason since spring of 2016 when I was a fellow in residence at the Clark Institute in Williamstown. And Jason was a teaching assistant in art history at Williams College, having just completed his MA. Um, before Williams, he had studied at Vassar, um, getting a BA in art history with a, a correlate sequence in German studies. Um, in the course of those years, he also acquired <coughs> excuse me, um, a mastery or partial mastery of Russian in Moscow, Polish in Krakow, um, and uh, French at Williams, as well as a couple of years of Swedish and an undergraduate, um, as an undergraduate, and Estonian um, through several language courses in Tallinn and Tartu. So we were fascinated and impressed and kind of jealous. Um, he then came to Hopkins to work with my wonderful erstwhile colleague, uh, Molly Warnock. Um, let's see, and he's currently a um, Leonard Lauder pre-doctoral fellow um, at the Lauder Research Center for Modern Art at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, Jason's dissertation um, is on the Russian avant-garde uh, avant -garde artist student collective um, affirmers of the new art. Um, I'm going to butcher its um, actual name, Ut Verdetele Novogo Iskustva, um, abbreviated as UNOVIS. Um, and also <coughs> with a particular attention to the collective's founding figure, um, Kazimir Malievich. Um, the, he argues that the political collectivists' um, convictions served as the precondition for the emergence of geometrical abstraction <clears throat> and traces the group from its founding at the People's Art Academy in Vitebsk in 1919 to its proliferation to various sites across the new Soviet states, to its afterlife after the group's formal disbanding in 1922, but its, and its um, long afterlife where it continues to influence um, uh, artistic education throughout the Soviet Union and uh, also Central and Eastern Europe. Um, it, it's um, the ability to range between this sort of historically panoramic and then the sort of critical study, the deep analysis of works of art is um, a, one of the goals of our graduate training um, at, at Johns Hopkins. And Jason came in knowing how to do this. He has a really strong sense of the moral and intellectual imperatives and critical demands of art history, of art history as a form of care. And um, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see some of that today in a paper entitled Abstraction and Analogy, an Analogy in Verwoka. Thank you. Jason. Thanks, Stephen, for that generous introduction. And thank you, everyone here, um, Aliyah, especially for organizing the symposium. I'm very excited to hear your papers and talk more with you about everything that's going on. So my paper today looks at a somewhat early and understudied moment in the history of modern art in Russia when a group of artists organized around Kazimir Malevich and a style of geometrical abstraction he called suprematism became involved in textile design. Between 1915 and 1919, these artists, now most known for their austere and withholding non-figurative paintings, entered into arrangements with artisan workshops in rural villages where suprematist designs were embroidered onto textiles like scarves, purses, pillowcases, commodities in short, but dream commodities with neither mass production nor even sale ever realized. They were exhibited, though, in a number of very well-attended shows in Moscow. Uh, the photograph of the first in 1915, sorry, the first, the first of which in 1915 I'm showing right now. This episode, largely unremarked in histories, uh, in accounts of, Russian, of the Russian avant-garde, demonstrates that the heady and rarefied art of suprematism was in fact born with an unexpected nearness to lived life, that its emergence, both in the form of quotidian objects and execution through a kind of collective labor, was built into its practice from the start. For many of these artists, abstract painting was bound up in Malevich's sweeping philosophical campaign to disclose the world as a unified and undifferentiated entity. Within this monistic metaphysical structure, any notion of an individual is nonsensical for any apprehension of a person entails in the same movement an apprehension of its inextricability from a collective social fabric. 
And so it has been with difficulty and fascination that I try to triangulate the speculative, collectivist, theoretical aspirations of suprematism with its actual formal manifestations. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and so it has been with difficulty and fascination that I try to triangulate the speculative, collectivist, theoretical aspirations of suprematism with its actual formal manifestations, let alone the workaday realities of collective or collaborative labor. Today, I want to float analogy as a conceptual structure with which to assay these varied relationships, what aesthetic form might disclose about the constitution of social life and work, and what paths collaboration might have opened in developing suprematist form. To begin to explain what I mean by, the, by an analogical understanding of abstraction, I want to borrow a comparison used by the scholar Maria Guff to open the first chapter of her book, The Artist's Producer, Constructivism and Revolution. These are two paintings by uh, Kazimir Malevich done in 1915 and almost certainly exhibited at the 010 Last Futurist Exhibition of Painting in Petrograd the same year. The show is most remembered uh, for the debut of his suprematist composition, Black Square. Malevich's room here is on the left, on the left, excuse me, and we can see the Black Square in the upper corner. Um, it was known as well for uh, the conflict between Malevich's suprematist painting and the constructions of Vladimir Tatlin. On the right is a photograph of one of Tatlin's corner counter reliefs, now lost. Its severe agglomeration of metal planes, curved and harshly angled, aim at disclosing qualities proper to the materials of which it's, com of which it's composed. A commitment to the material reality of the world, which Malevich's work, as the story goes, appears to deny. We know from contemporary photographs of Malevich's gallery at 010 that the work on the right, simply titled Suprematism and now in the State Russian Museum in St. Petersburg, was included in the exhibition, while the presence of four squares on the left, now in Saratov, is likely though insecure. In four squares, Malevich splits his canvas roughly evenly along the, uh, the vertical and horizontal axes, dividing it into four equal, or roughly equal quadrants. Moving clockwise from the upper left, the canvas's recursive squares go white, black, white, black, deriving the work's checkerboard effect from the structure of the support itself. In this account, four squares organizational motivation, to borrow Guff's term via Saussure, relies less on individual creati creative subjectivity, subjectivity of some kind, we might note though, is nonetheless a plan of its initial decision to paint the painting, um, than it does the parameters of the painting itself. Far more typical of Malevich's work is the St. Petersburg picture, Guff's counterexample. Foregoing the equilateral format of four squares, the work on the right adopts a portrait's dimensions in a widely varied range of geometric, for geometric forms arrayed in a steep diagonal from the work's upper left to its lower center. Sharply acute triangles point from the corner to a rectangle, <clears throat> sorry, Sharply acute triangles point from the corner to a rectangle itself tilted downward to the left, an orientation echoed by a cluster of rectangular forms roughly three quarters to the right across the upper register. The tentative kinship between these forms is undone, however, by myriad variously disposed forms abounding throughout the composition. An inventory could include the straw-colored trapezoid, the most conspicuous element of the composition, shifted askew from the former's shared axis. It set atop a red almond aperture within which a dot dash jumble floats about. The inventory could also include the horizontal bands roughly halfway down the work, the four repeated but irregular brackets mid-right, the variously angled rectangles of various widths tilting and leaning in various directions, clustering toward the bottom of the work as if drawn down by low gravity. The list goes on. To describe what she calls the chaotic articulation of the St. Petersburg suprematism, Guff follows Malevich's student, Władysław Szyminski, in characterizing its arrangement of forms addressed to paintings traditional compositional problems of balance and relationality as Baroque. Her account, <clears throat> um, her account though, caught between the tension between willed creative composition and the drive to evacuate individual subjectivity from the fabrication of works of art that became the determining concern of the constructivists um, leaves Malevich here. <laughs> Um, these constructivists, their work, heterogeneous as it was, was unified in an attempt to subvert the perceived historical imperative of modern Western art as creative self-expression, orienting itself toward a notion of utility, a term variously understood as the interrogation of materials with the aim of uncovering and cultivating properties, um, properties of use to a post-revolutionary society, 
or more directly dissolving art into industrial production to manufacture actual useful objects. Where does this leave a work like suprematism then, with its ambition to reassort the contiguity between art and life, embodying what Malevich, in an essay accompanying the, ex the painting's exhibition at 010, termed the new painterly realism? His argument goes something like this. A suprematist painting shows form itself unbeholden to a thing in the world. It reveals the fact that even a figurative painting, and Ilya Rapin's Ivan the Terrible and His Son is his named example, is not identical with what it represents, an obvious point he seems nonetheless compelled to make. Um, um, instead, even Rapin's painting is built up from painterly form in the same way Malevich's is but the forms of Rapine's composition are veiled by the representational function to which they're subordinated. If suprematism discloses the, the real nature of the new painterly realism, how does it stand within relation to the world in which it moves? Malevich, for his part, provides no clear answer. Indeed, his refusal to define suprematism positively is a curious feature of his text. Instead, the new art is described negatively in terms of what it is not, namely, all art previously. For example, he writes, oops, sorry. For example, he writes, <clears throat> in, in intending to transmit the living form of nature, artists transmitted its corpse in a picture. They should have created, but they merely repeated. Or later, the art of painting, the word, sculpture, was a kind of camel, loaded with all the trash of odalisques, salames, princes and princesses. Painting was the aesthetic side of the object, but it was never an independent form, an independent end in and of itself. As demonstrated by Irina Sakno, Malevich's manner of argumentation here and elsewhere shares, if not derives, its structure from a form of Christian apologetics dominant among, among Orthodox thinkers, many of whom wrote broadly on contemporary politics and culture and were active within Malevich's milieu. Apophatic or negative theology is founded on the premise that God cannot be cognized by rational thought nor described in human language. Instead, the mind can only direct itself toward the divine through, an infinite, through infinite negative statements about what he is not. Scriptural examples abound. From the Gospel of John, no one has or can see God. Or from 1 Timothy, he lives an unapproachable light. From Job, his ways are unsearchable and unfathomable, etc. Malevich too suggests that his notion of an all-encompassing reality cannot be captured in reason, demanding instead intuitive perception in its place. At risk of ascribing to Malevich a level of philosophical knowledge that cannot be substantiated by the historical record, I feel compelled to acknowledge the apophatic model's pre-Christian roots in Plato's Parmenides. In this dialogue, Socrates attempts to resolve the ostensible contradiction between individual being and the unity in which it is part, a concern we'll see Malevich shares too. If I am one, how am I composed of many parts that are at once themselves and uh, themselves, me, and yet unlike one another? How do I think of, some, of myself as something beyond myself that is both plural and unified, and sometimes neither? Through a series of critical negations, we could call it his via negativa, Plato Socrates stages the logical jam of part and whole. He turns onto the frontage road. Analogy arrives as a sideways reconciliation of this paradox. Just as one is both one and part of a whole, so too is the day one, yet in many different places at many and different times. Analogy is a natural complement to apophatic theology. It points toward the ineffable, like the Godhead, by offering up a statement like, God is love, to say that, though the object of my love is unknowable, it shares the same relationship between devotee and divine, as does loved and beloved. Anna, upon, Logos, word, of course, but in Greek also ratio. Analogy claims not identity between the objects of comparison, but the identity of a shared relationship. Pen is to paper as brush is to canvas, not because a pen is a brush, nor paper canvas, but because each pair shares the relationship of mark making. To return to the St. Petersburg picture, we might think it along Malevich's own words when he writes, there exist three beginnings in man, one attempts to make his personality keep its purity, that his eye should transcend the frontiers of commonness, the other wishes to rule, to make everything subservient to itself and to become the crown. The third annihilates itself in, itself in the name of commonness, wishing to make the masses rebel in the name of unity, 
It wishes that all should have before them one form of world structure so that the universe as a monoform should travel more quickly toward infinite perfection. The painting seems caught between Malevich's first and second imaginings of man, holding in tension the autonomy of individual form and the composition in which it's part. Shapes next to one another declare camaraderie through things like shared parallel edges or the general compositional tumble from the top left to bottom center. But any sort of totally subsuming compositional organization is undermined by greater or lesser deviations. The fourth bracket in the left center group, for instance, dropping a step below the other three, reasserting the autonomy of the painting's individual elements within the overall composition. I'm claiming, rather simply, that Malevich's paintings analogize his philosophy of community. With a painting like MoMA's White on White from 1918, analogous to the total dissolution of the ego, he claims as his endgame. Indeed, the thorny relationship between individual and collective, and in particular the primacy of the latter, was a major concern in modern Russian thought, from Tolstoy and Chernyshevsky to Plekhanov and Lenin, leading Malevich's contemporary, the philosopher Nikolai Vajayev, to term it the Russian idea. Why the analogical function of Malevich's paintings matter, however, is an open question. I want to suggest that the collective relations analogically modeled in Malevich's suprematist paintings were to some greater or lesser degree active in forms of collaborative labor from their earliest instances. For the 010 exhibition, is not where what would come to be known as suprematism made its debut, nor was the 1913 production of Victory Over the Sun, as Malevich's writing has suggested, and people familiar with this material might know what I'm talking about. Um, in November of 1915, just one month before the opening of 010, a number of embroidered textile designs featuring abstract geometrical designs debuted at the Exhibition of Contemporary Decorative Art held at the Le Mercier Gallery in Moscow. Organized by Malevich, Ivan Puni, and Ksenia Bogoslavskaya, this exhibition brought to public attention the fruits of a collaboration between modern Russian artists and women artisans from the villages of Verbovka and Skopci, uh, which is now known as Vesila Nivka. The arrangement was initiated by the artist Alexandra Exter, who introduced Malevich to the artist and aristocrat Natalia Davidova, whose family owned the Verbovka Artiel, um, which is a word for this kind of artisan workshop in Russian. The Skopsi RTL is unfortunately less well documented, though we do have reason to suspect it focused more on reviving traditional Ukrainian handicraft design than did Verbovka. These women-run workshop collectives were designed, in part, to incorporate rural women into the wage economy from which they had been historically excluded, charged instead with sustaining their male farming counterparts whose activities were no longer able to generate adequate income in the late imperial financial system. Hoping to generate new income for the Artel, Davidova, who herself had close ties with many members of the cultural elite, solicited textile designs from Malevich, as well as a number of artists who would later join his suprematist campaign um, in the group and journal called Supremus. These arrangements would continue um, until the late 1910s, with works being shown at a second exhibition in Moscow in 1917 and included in the state exhibition of applied art of the Applied Art Workshop in, Mos in the Moscow Museum of Fine Arts the following year. Excuse me. I think the blank slide might have been a little confusing. Um, is there a way to advance to the next slide? It, there we go. Thank you. While Malevich's designs were shown only in the 1915 show. The artists Olga Rozanova, Lyubov Popova, Nadezhda Udaltseva, and Davidova herself would contribute the majority of the later designs. And here we can see two reconstructed spreads from the first unpublished issue of Supremas, which was to feature a section devoted to the decorative arts and contain photographs of some of the realized designs. I want to conclude with a design by Malevich to suggest excuse me, to suggest that the particular developments in his practice may well emerge as analogs to the kind of work realized in Verbovka. The inventory of the 1915 exhibition indicates Malevich contributed three designs, two for scarves and one for a pillow, which was later realized and exhibited in 1917. And we're seeing a picture of the pillow now, obviously the work on the left. Excuse me. 
The design was based on the work on the left, <clears throat> an untitled suprematist composition from 1915, which is an inversion of the embroidered design as the Verbovka artisans outline the composition onto the reverse of the fabric and fill the shapes in with darning stitches. Because embroidery is done by leading thread in and out of the pillowcase's warp weft matrix, the differently colored components of the embroidered design do not in fact overlap one another. This is unlike an oil painting where a painter could, if they wanted, layer painted shapes on top of one another in order to communicate recession. This is not the case in many of Malevich's suprematist paintings. Perhaps he was envisioning the manufacture of his embroidered designs when, in painterly realism of a footballer from 1915, he does not first paint a solid yellow trapezoid over which he draws his cobalt line, but actually two separate shapes um, whose upper and bottom edges respectively lie flush with the form that cuts through it. And this is a device that uh, we can see visible in the prime canvas peeking through the, uh, you know, the gaps between the blue and the yellow. Perhaps Malevich was thinking of Verbovka II, and perhaps analogically, to consider the admittedly uneven relationship between designer and fabricator when he went on to attempt to reconstruct or to restructure the art academy in Vitebsk only a few years later. There he would introduce an ostensibly more de-hierarchized and democratic model of pedagogy and collectivized artistic production. We know from a letter to Mikhail Matyushin that Malevich was electrified by this collaborative opportunity, calling it a great treasure, but lamenting that he would not be able to be present in Verbovka himself. These arrangements with Worldcraft workshops were accorded major significance within the early Bolshevik administration, in which its members occupied key positions. Within the Commissariat for the Enlightenment, known as Narkompros, whose subdivisions oversaw the administration of the arts, Malevich headed the subcommittee for the preservation of historic monuments. Rosanova was brought on too as the director of the subdivision of applied arts, a position she shared with Alexander Rodchenko. Where Rodchenko committed himself to industrial production, Rosanova's role suggests an interest in absorbing traditional craft production and its laborers, otherwise administered by trade unions, into the collective artistic program of the early Soviet state. And so Verbovka becomes a means of extending suprematism's collective analogy beyond the canvas or the workshop to the very fabric of a centralized cultural bureaucracy where hierarchical, hierarchical distinctions between media and geographical distance to boot are dissolved into a fantasy of a collective mission and a shared vision of a world. But even there, the collective gazamp fl flickers and fades as contingencies intrude, the individual persists. Indeed, the individual Rosanova seemed to carry the weight of these collective enterprises alone. And with her untimely death in 1918, the short-lived alliance between rural artiele and the avant-garde in turn unraveled. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I invite the other uh, speakers up to the stage, please. Thank you so much for those um, just fascinating talks when we, um, you know, that the paper topics, the titles come in, um, I think before we have the abstracts, and we try to put them into to sessions where the things sort of seem like each other. These were completely different <laughs> um, in every way, um, but, you know, so interesting, um, just very in different and interesting, I think methodological approaches. So I've got um, a couple of questions for each of you, and, um, and then we will open it up. Um, I will start with Brittany. Um, you know, it was, it was really interesting um, to hear about the fact that these Chinese American communities were actually in the process of changing a lot and modernizing, and yet Henry um, just kind of painted that out of those portraits, um, right, in favor of representing something sort of like more authentic and, and, and stable. Um, it is, you know, it, it reminds me a lot of Gauguin going to Tahiti, um, being disappointed by how modern T Tahiti had become, and then 
proceeding to ignore all of that and just paint his, his fantasy. Um, so, so what you're talking about, it's got all the kind of, you know, it's, it's classic primitivism. Um, and I guess, so my question is, I'm, I'm curious why you don't use the word um, at all in your talk. I do use it in the dissertation. <laughs> it's not forgotten. Um, I don't use it in the talk just because the way I had described it in the dissertation, it actually ends up being uh, a break between primitivism, orientalism, and the Japanisma, which is described as three stages um, from Japanese array to Japanisma, which is an, an um, kind of an, an, an evolution of the level of assimilation of these Japanese um, forms and ideas. Um, primitivism for me was, um, it felt limited actually, mm -hmm. um, because it, he does have this kind of process of evolution, even though he shows these things as kind of existing in an idealized past. Um, it just felt limiting in the sense that um, I don't think he was trying to do the same thing quite as, as Gauguin was. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not articulating this very well. <laughs> no, I figured that there was a sort of deliberate reason to to to, uh, to not there use was. that that language. And, it just yeah. got really big, really fast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, I kind of simplified it for the sake of our talk today, but it, it is incorporated, um, and I do I do think that what he's trying to do is is to kind of look back as a way to look forward, if that makes sense. Um, yes. Yeah. And so. Um, Thank you. I also was just wondering um, how were these, so you said that these these portraits were exhibited yes. during his lifetime? Twice. And how were they, um, how were they received by critics? Were they talked about as being sort of very truthful representations? Yeah, so they were first exhibited while he was in California at the Panama California exhibition mm -hmm. in 1915, so like a little world's fair next to the Panama Pacific Exposition at the same time. Um, and they got, they, they didn't get a lot of press there. They were kind of just brushed over. But when he came back to New York, he displayed them at Macbeth Gallery, which was his primary dealer. And they were um, picked up by the local press, like the New York Times and McCormick, William McCormick describes them as, um, He's really fascinated by the idea that Henry can actually individualize these figures. There's a sense that you can't tell the difference for a general New York audience between different Asian peoples. Um, so that's kind of the, where they focus is on the, the realism of these things. The idea that you can connect these to individual people as opposed to just like a type or a... Um, yeah, I thought that was an important distinction in your paper. The, the, the fact that they, he was individualizing them, but also still creating this kind of fantasy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, OK, thank you. Tony, um, the other Tony mentioned your methodological resourcefulness <laughs> um, and creativity. Um, I mean, I love your talk. It was, you know, it was like hanging on every word. Um, I, I guess um, I'll, I'll say, first of all, that I found it. I found it really convincing um, that the confusion that he creates, that Rosa was creating, is deliberate, and that he was thinking in atomist terms. Um, I wonder. I I was. I liked the way that you were imagining this exchange between Simonelli and Rosa, but I. I guess I'm. I just have a question about why you did it that way. Mm -hmm because you could have made the same argument without that. And so, you know, what was your thinking that led you to kind of taking us through this imagined exchange? Um, thank you. So I think a large reason for this kind of organization is to realize the cultural consciousness that he has was intended for a con contemporary audience. And I think Simonelli really embodied the type of audience that he was working his painting for, in the sense that, you know, I think it's easy to think, oh, all this very elaborate organization is for this 
anonymous viewer group that can somehow mm -hmm. decipher it. But what I think is really interesting is that he seemed really um, insistent that this was meant for a type of people that he could communicate with in both literary and visual terms. And I discovered, thanks to uh, Alexandra Hoare, um, that you know he actually wrote about you know having this one friend who has the privilege to see the painting before its grand opening. And I'm just really curious, what would someone of his own cir social circle react to the kind of intellectual puzzles that he's weaving, basically um, not only to contextualize the social considerations of the painting, but also to kind of give a name to the process to realize, you know, there were actual people that he was probably thinking about. And I think um, that's a large aspect of Rosa's study nowadays is that he's such a socially engaged painter. You know, he had friends who were professors, healers, um, you know, religious figures and scholars. So he was making art for a very specific group. And I think that changes how we recreate the rhetoric that he was using. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, this, and this, this idea that he is sort of deliberately confusing the viewer, um, but then the viewer is ultimately rewarded mm -hmm. through, you know, by the, through the, the labor of, of bringing in all of these different areas of knowledge and, and interpreting it. Um, I, I wonder, though, if the viewer is, if, if what he meant to do is not reward the viewer, is to ultimately just frustrate the viewer. And that's where the despair comes from. Yeah. Like, it's like, and, I, and I, I, I'm sure this is what you were saying, but I'm, I guess I'm just saying it again, is that it's like putting the viewer in the position yeah. of Democritus, yeah. feeling that, mm -hmm. you know, all these individual details that have meaning on their own are not, like, adding up to anything in the end. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely right in the sense that we're really meant to sympathize with Democritus in this mm -hmm. way, in the sense that we're witnessing him witnessing something that is mm -hmm. also bothering us. Um, and I totally think many of the viewers of the time probably didn't get the painting. Um, I, th I think that's also why he had to add the explanation two years later when he was making the print. Right. And to be, oh, we, uh, there's a point to yeah, this Yeah, I meant to do this, yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and the, you know, the painting had a terrible time um, on the market. Nobody wanted oh. to buy it for wow. several years. Um, so I don't think it was as popular as he thought it would be, especially because um, I think just the structure itself is just so complicated. Um, that's why I think he really wanted Simonelli to prove read the painting before he put it out, because it could really just be nonsense, I think, to a lot of people. Thank you. Um, and Jason, um, you know, also just fascinating. Um, first of all, learning that uh, that that suprematism kind of started in this embroidery workshop. Is that fair to say? Um, or had a moment where it was... You know, I, I don't want to necessarily sort of like chronol chronologize right. this in a way that, um, you know, I might not be able to necessarily defend, but the they, they did sort of um, emerge simultaneously and it's just, you know, kind of hugely fascinating, I think. It's um, totally fascinating, yeah. and the that, fact that this that is the first public that it's um, sort of suppressed in the literature because that's not our what you know our understanding of, of what it's supposed to, it's supposed to be withholding, mm -hmm. as you say, not about like lived life, but I, which just it's, it's so interesting, um, and you know your whole argument about the the part to the whole and um, and the paintings um, analogizing his uh, philosophy of community. Um, this idea that paintings, if I'm understanding correctly, are sort of um, that the which one the the white on white um, being about the annihilation of the self, the annihilation of the ego. Um, I think so. Here's my question: um, If that's what he's getting at. Um, and if it's if it's relating back to sort of his experience designing for this workshop, isn't that in some ways like the ultimate expression of the ego? Yeah, I think there's a total tension. Is my microphone off? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so I mean, 
It, it, it's very interesting because I think that this relationship between, you know, part and whole and individual and collective isn't one in which uh, either term is sort of subsumed in the other and one comes out kind of free. Because like a major term for Malevich is intu intuition, creative intuition, intu intuitive reason, as opposed to sort of like ratio insinuation or like rational thought. And so it, it just sort of seems that like these things, if they disclose anything, isn't some kind of like meaning or message like a, a sort of like aboutness but that they sort of like embody a relationship between things that doesn't require like a sort of identity of the term so it's not that like a form is like a square is a person and the composition is a collective necessarily but that the relationship between those two things is shared or paralleled in some ways um and i think that this is something that obtains as well in the way that like the ego like the single creative ego ends up sort of playing out um especially in the way that Malevich was acting in the early Bolshevik administration because he's kind of contriving at like every instance to bring so many different areas of art, including I think this textile production under his own purview, under the auspices of a sort of collective mission. But it's really not necessarily like a dissolution of individual artistic egos that then become a sort of unified collective movement, but more like an, a dissolution of individual artistic egos that are subsumed, subsumed under his. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, I think these things are just like kind of constantly in tension and constantly being negotiated on the fly. Um, and then, yeah, it's, you know, for a whole host of historic reasons cut very short before it kind of comes into anything I think it ever dreamed for itself. Thank you. I also wonder if, um, if you've thought about how gender plays into this at all. Yeah, it's really interesting and something that I wanna get into, you know, a little bit more as I develop, this is a part of my second chapter. One thing I would say is that there's a really fascinating book that was written recently about the way that women labor collectives figure into the sort of Russian imagination of community um, in the ninth, like from essentially Tolstoy to um, Soviet cinema. And it just, it kind of comes up all the time and usually in a really funny way as a sort of foil to rational argumentation and things. So I know in Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done, which is this novel, um, about you know kind of like labor collectives and things um that ends up becoming the basis of lenin's what is to be done this kind of very long pamphlet he writes in 1902 i believe um that shares the same title but in it the two there are two male main characters who are just kind of constantly debating fruitlessly about you know what to do um and all the meanwhile there's this uh woman character who is visited by these three personifications of various sort of like feminized traits and she ends up forming this very utopian um, sewing collective. Um, so this is one example in which uh, these sorts of arrangements maybe have like a sort of like literary or, you know, um, other sort of manifestation within the Russian imagination. And so I just think, yeah, the whole, the whole gender dynamic that like this sort of other to the current state of things is being figured as the feminine, both, yeah, within sort of like literary and um, cinematic production throughout the 19th and 20th century, but then it's also in an instance like this being sort of literari literalized, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd love to um, open it up to questions from the audience. There's a couple over there. Hi, I, for you, Tony, I just uh, love the talk. I was very convinced by your emphasis on how Democritus is represented as uh, not laughing, as what everyone would have expected. So right away, Rosa is uh, convincing us of his genius, which is typical of Rosa. I wanted to ask, um, beyond his playful, uh, playfulness and in his inversions. Do, do you see the Democritus as a self-representation? Because it's such a despairing image and we know that he suffered so many personal losses at, at this point in his life. So I'm wondering about the atomism and the Epicureanism. Is, is he questioning faith here? Did, did you think of it in those terms. It's very unorthodox yeah. uh, in the context of uh, Catholicism mm -hmm. in the period. So, um, Thank you, Catherine, for the question. Um, and I think, first of all, I think in the 
when it was exhibited, I, don't, I think maybe some people didn't realize it was Democritus. I think um, there are contemporary records as, you know, of people referring to this as a Heraclitus because it's the iconography. And I think that's probably why he added the caption specifically saying, oh, this is Democritus, this is not Heraclitus. And, you know, I'm doing all this um, to turn him into a different figure. And I really, I think um, your point about you know, this kind of autobiographical reference in the figure of Democritus is spot on because, um, um, first of all, I think his self-portrait, which we have seen uh, in the beginning, really has, shares a lot of similarities with um, the Dem uh, Democritus portrait. And I think the way that he was writing at the time does seem to suggest that he was thinking in Democritus terms about, you know, um, things falling apart in his personal life, in his career. But I also think there's a different angle um, that is worth noting. Um, so when he came back to Rome from Florence and started putting out these images, he had really high ambitions, right? He left Rome in disgrace and came back to kind of woo the whole audience. So I think there was genuine positive ideas about, you know, his intel intellectual power, about his sophistication. Um, so I think the negative message of the painting itself may not have translated immediately to the exhibition itself. But I think over time, especially in turning the painting into print and, in, you know, kind of re reworking the painting into a caption about the print, he definitely was thinking much more um, about his personal life and his realization about, especially, you know, the painting that he had very high hopes wasn't selling. So figure, right? <laughs> Jason, I had a question about how one broadly distinguishes the seduction towards a political reading that I think you brilliantly outlined um, in Malevich's work from contemporaneous movements that are also all about the relationship of the individual and the collective. And I'm thinking here of everything from vitalism to theosophy. At the same historical moment in other European countries, these issues are bubbling forth and they're not read in political terms. So I'm wondering, are we being seduced by the nascent Sovietism to give this that read, or and is it more proper to instead understand Russia in connection with these other national arts? Yeah, this is very, it's interesting. And I mean, I mean, the interest in Russia and things like, the, you know, the fourth dimension, uh, Pyotr Spensky writes this, you know, book called like Tertium Organum that's supposed to be the sort of like third in uh, like, you know, like a totally like new, like metaphysical reappraisal of the world after Bacon and um, Aristotle or something. But uh, I guess it just seems that its manifestation in the Russian context is one that uh, even before Malevich is kind of historically bound up in politics and the idea of a sort of notion of collectivity. The thing that I, do, I try to do in my first chapter is tease out a little bit of this intellectual prehistory. Um, I suppose to me, even more compelling than these sorts of, uh, you know, readings of like theosophy in the fourth dimension, which tend to be what Malay just spoken of most, you know, in connection with, I've really found the sort of particular theological discourses of the late 19th century to be very interesting, mainly these ideas that uh, particularly about the icon as it being a sort of um, not a representation of an individual face of Christ, namely, but rather that Christ is somebody who, who you know, we are created in the image of, contains within himself all individual likenesses that sort of, you know, shine forth. And then the encounter with the other, like another human being in life by this sort of, you know, person, Christ, person, connection, ends up also disclosing the fact that there's some sort of like shared thing that is prior to individuality. Um, so it's, it's a loose way. I mean, and I, you know, I don't want to sort of, uh, have such a, have a sort of like weak concept of analogy that literally anything can be a sort of like analogous parallel to anything else, which, you know, I think is a danger that maybe this talk nears, but, um, <laughs> but I think that these sorts of, yeah, like these discourses of the fourth dimension and these ideas of, a of, of metaphysical unity that do not have sort of like discrete separations are really, really I mean, we might want to say like epistemologically in line with these theological and social readings that are just so interesting. And I mean, Malevich's own writing, even though he's not referencing these things exactly, is borrowing the rhetoric almost verbatim, which is to me fascinating. <laughs>
I actually have questions for both Tony and for Brittany, but I don't want to take up too much time. So um, can I ask them back to back or should I take a break yeah, and let somebody else? Um, I, I want to ask Tony first because I know more, I think I'm closer to Tony's field. Um, and I, <laughs> I, do, I know a lot less about Brittany's. Anyway, um, stop wasting time. Um, Tony, I, I think you're absolutely right. I'm very persuaded by the, um, the conceit that's at work in the, the, the change of identification, that the playing with codes representing the philosopher um, Heraclitus turned into Democritus really does reveal the importance of titling and of the kind of PR work that artists do uh, through print culture um, about the work. There's also, um, to pair the last question, a, a, a tradition of identifying artists as gloomy philosophers because they are hoarders of bones and grisly body parts and Asari talks about artists, you know, like a gloomy philosopher keeping uh, dead men's limbs under his bed and then becoming ill with the, <laughs> with, with the decay. Um, what I need to know more about, though, is polvere, um, powder, dust. Um, if, if, if this is your link to atomism, I just need to know about what the semantic uh, field for, you know, the, the reference to atoms. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tasso, for instance, uses Lucretius. Mm -hmm. um, Lucretius is never put in the index. It's a round. Mm -hmm. you know, art, uh, po po poets are imitating Lucretius in Italian. I'm just wondering, is a polvere a synonym for atoms? Can it be? Mm -hmm. It seems to me it resonates far more with the book of Ecclesiasticus mm -hmm. and with the, um, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, like all is dust, you know? Mm -hmm. Because um, atomists tend to refer to particles um, as uh, using you know, as things. Mm -hmm. you know, they're very, very tiny, but they're not dust. Dust su suggests formlessness. Mm -hmm. Atoms have a kind of a form. They're described as semina, you know, semina rerum, seeds. Um, so I just need to know more. Maybe you have um, a, a way of sort of building on that claim. Um, thank you for the question. And I definitely think that's where a lot of tension is, is um, the poem, the satire helps me to contextualize how he was thinking about this process of decomposition. But I, I, I agree that it's not entirely um, plausible that he was thinking exactly atomist terms. So the way I, th I th always think, um, you know, I, I would rather say he was thinking about the, the rhetoric of things being granular, of things, you know, um, not having steady forms that are, you know, internal to any object like dust, you know, they, they scatter, they, they are formless in the sense that um, atoms might, might be. And, um, and I, I don't think Rosa was an expert on Democritus. Um, he does have a friend who was teaching Greek philosophy at Pisa at the time. So I think he might have had references from his friend um, about you know how this process is working, but I don't think necessarily he was thinking exactly um, you know, powders as literal atoms. Um, and I, I, in the original uh, script, I, I talk a little bit about Gassendi and you know and you know the actual ways that his contemporaries were talking about atoms and it's very different and so I don't think he Rosa was an atomist I think he was using the conceit of atomic um, transformation to make a point about just the general disorganization of matter that it's not specific to any branch of philosophy in that sense um, that's my current understanding and I do think um, you know, it's kind of worth going back to all the poetries and rethink what genuinely, you know, um, he meant by those words, yeah. I think if you want to ask the question to, to Brittany and then uh, we'll break for lunch. Sure thing, um, but unless there's somebody else we really wants to um, have a go, okay. Um, Brittany, th I, I, this is really compelling. I didn't know this material at all. And one question that occurred to me, um, just you know, in my mind as I was listening to you and looking at those extraordinary and disturbing uh, portraits, was I uh, just you know, for instance, um, in Chinese communities, portrait studios, um, portrait photography by Chinese photographers, how Chinese um, subjects are presented through photography. Do they tend to reproduce this kind of cultural coding? You know, this dominant cultural coding, or you know, do, do we find them contested in any way? I mean, it's probably not somewhere you wanted to go, but um, I, I, I was wondering if it's something you thought about. Yeah, and just quickly coming back to Martha, I should have mentioned that my dissertation focuses largely on Orientalism and Japanese, because of a connection to James McNeil Whistler. So he's not looking at Gauguin so much as someone like Whistler. Um, so it's a different focus for him. 
if that makes sense. In terms of the photography that's uh, of actual Chinese communities by Chinese photographers and Chinese artists, um, they it's very mixed. So they, they're representing themselves as evolving, essentially. Most of the photography is going to be family photography. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, well, it's, it's mostly family photography. And you can see them kind of evolving in these photos. So older generations tended to wear, especially women, tended to wear traditional attire. And it wasn't always like the festival attire that is essentially what these girls are wearing. Um, it's kind of a dumbed down version of their festival attire in terms of color and, and that. Um, but then, the, so the older generations would be wearing more traditional clothing. Men were typically wearing business atti westernized business attire because they're, they're more out in the community um, as public figures. And I think there was a strong effort to uh, not assimilate, but to kind of fit in um, because there was so much anti-Asian sentiment at the moment, um, especially with, you know, the Page Act and, and um, all, all the legislation that happens in the 1880s. Um, but you do see kids wearing hybrid clothing. So you'll have girls with big bows, you'll have them wearing, um, but then wearing these kind of more traditional outfits in some photos, it's very mixed. They're kind of all over the place. But yeah, the self-representation is, is showing the evolution, whereas Henry is very much showing this kind of frozen moment or this kind of devolution. Thank you.